So welcome everyone to uh, Business Succession Strategies and Preserving Your Legacy. Um, this is part of uh, Owners to Owners, which is an Employee Ownership NYC initiative. Um, we have a great panel discussion planned for you today that features experts in small business here in New York City, as well as New York City business owners exploring um, transferring businesses to employee ownership as part of succession planning. We're also going to have a short Q&A session following our panel. And if you have any questions so that this discussion is taking place, please put them in the chat and we will make sure to get to them. Um, for business owners and organizations that are here today, uh, please introduce yourselves in the chat, your business name, the borough you're in, um, or your organization name and borough. So I am going to pass this on now to Rebecca Laurie. Rebecca is on faculty with the Urban Studies Department at CUNY, and she's the founder of the Community and Worker Ownership Project at the City University of New York School for Labor and Urban Studies. Rebecca began her working career as a union carpenter and transitioned into worker education through the union's apprenticeship program and the construction industry. Through her work, Rebecca is dedicated and passionate about inclusive community economic development, having collaborated on numerous initiatives in New York City relating to worker ownership and equitable economies. So I'll pass it on to Rebecca now. Thank you so much, Antu. Thanks so much. That introduction sort of says so much, but I think the context I'd like to lay this up with is um, as a lifelong New Yorker, um, love my city and love the businesses in our city that make it go. And as a worker, love being part of any one of them that I am. So right now my passion and part is with uh, CUNY, but so many workers come to work each day happy with what they do. And so many worker owners, so many owners, let me correct myself, so many owners of companies are proud to do the business they do and have a team that does it with them. And the notion of uh, secession planning is something that a smart business owner is always thinking about. And when they're able to take that secession planning idea and really think about how do I think about giving it to the workers or selling it to the workers and having the workers really take the helm uh, in, in retirement, it's such a wonderful way to pass on the legacy into the hands of the people who are really making that business function along with the owner and all of the shared passion that everybody can bring to it. I like to tie this somewhat into the current events of the day, which is uh, not only COVID, um, but um, a sentiment of a history of oppression in our country that is uh, perhaps we're moving towards a, a large reckoning. And that large reckoning means that we recognize people are in pain and hurt from all the oppression they may face, but when they can go to work proudly, that's one place they can feel self-actualized and um, engaged. And how do we make our places of work a place of healing as well? Partly that is when people can have some control and ownership and democratic engagement in the place where they work. So I want to really um, honor the notion of shifting our economy to a place where in that economy we are healing and caring for each other as well as running the business that we have in front of us. Um, I'm going to be introducing our next speakers and having each of them speak a little bit about their business and their place in the world. We'll be ending with um, Kathy Lubinsky speaking from the Small Business Services. And I think it's really exciting to note that our city and the Small Business Services Agency is backing this up in such a big way to help businesses think about how to put the uh, ownership, the control and the secession of small businesses into the hands of the workforce. So I love that as a way of saying, we are practicing our um, collective strength towards making businesses stronger and making our city stronger as part of our healing through COVID. So Kathy will um, be the third speaker after we hear from our two panelists. And let me say, Myra Castillo and Eric Greenberg, I'm so happy to have you each in the room today. Um, Myra represents the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, as I mentioned a 
lifelong New Yorker, I remember when the Navy Yard was in ruins and I toured it a long time ago when um, Andrew Kimball was still putting together the financing to bring it back to life. There were, uh, there were pockets of life. Sweet and Low was there, never left, for example. But really it's, it's just um, a fabulous piece of property for New York City to let small businesses grow in all these manufacturing spaces. So I'm very happy that um, Myra will be able to speak about the Brooklyn Navy Yard as a home for small businesses. Um, I believe it's 450 businesses employing over 11,000 people. How exciting is that? Um, you know, the days that I was able to visit and uh, visit businesses, each one is just so exciting. I remember being there um, soon after Superstorm Sandy and hearing from the workers at Ice Stone, which makes um, a product that of uh, crushed glass and cement countertops, talk about how they were able to bring the business back after that flood, which one can imagine the salt water from the flooding was ruining the machinery and the business thought they may have to close. And I spoke at that time with the business owner about uh, my, my point of entry is always about worker training and education. So what do the workers need? And he was saying, well, our workers know a lot. And what they need is a recognition that in all the things they know, we value them. And when they brought all that machinery back on, and my, my facts may be off, but the sentiment is true. He said, I'm going to give them part ownership in the company. And I believe it was 5% equity at the time. But how wonderful for a team of, you know, wasn't more than 20 people, then were able to have um, a stake in Ice Stone. So that goes back to the days following Sandy. But the Navy Yard has continued to grow and be a really vital hub. And Myra will speak more about that. And let me honor um, Eric Greenberg from um, Green Mountain Graphics, who's actually a small business owner thinking uh, constructively about his secession planning and how he's going to help his workers perhaps take the company as he moves towards retirement. And with that, I'll turn it over to each of you. And I think um, in that order, Myra, if you would speak a little bit about the Navy Yard, what you'd want to bring into this conversation, go for it. Um, pause a little bit, let Eric speak about his, and we'll facilitate a conversation for about 20 minutes. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for that lovely introduction. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, my name is Myra Castillo. And as Rebecca mentioned, um, I am from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I um, am the executive director of our business support services team. So one of the great things about the Brooklyn Navy Yard is that we really believe in the over 450 businesses that are located within the yard. So we do have a team that is dedicated to making sure that all of our companies have the programs and services necessary to make sure that they're really growing and scaling. So this to me is perfect because um, you know, succession planning, any type of information that I can get to our business owners to help them start thinking about um, how they grow, how they scale, how they advance to the next stage of their business is really is really what my directive is here. A little bit, and I will add my email to the chat to everyone. I'm happy to have everyone come and do a tour of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I will walk you through. Uh, Rebecca, please join us. Uh, I know it's been a while since you've been there, but I'm happy to just show everyone how this is really um, a great place for manufacturing uh, today. And so just a little bit about the Navy Yard. We're in a mission-driven industrial park. Um, we, have, we are home to over 450 businesses and more than 11,000 employees and people operating within the yard at over 300 acres of waterfront um, property here in Brooklyn. Um, we, you know, when, I, when I was asked to speak, one, other, one additional thing, before I took this job, which was in 2019, I was actually a small business owner myself and had owned a business with my best friend for 15 years prior to taking this job. So I really not only have this role of providing services to businesses, but I also feel all of that. Uh, um, firsthand, I felt all of these issues firsthand. In. And I think one of the things, and I will speak to all of this from a manufacturing perspective, but a lot of the issues are across the board, right? Um, I know for the business owners I interact with at the Navy Yard as well as for myself, um, when I was a business owner, 
this is your life, right? You are a business owner, but this is a part of, it's an emotional thing and it's part of your identity. Um, so it is very hard to think about what happens next because this is sort of what you've always done. And so I think that that is one of the challenges. It is, it's not just a business decision. It's often a very an emotional thing. And I think that no one ever feels that they're ready for the next phase necessarily. Like it's a process. And that is one of the things that I think is really important for people to start thinking about succession planning. Um, even if you might not be in a, in a moment where you're ready to do that, because I think arming yourself with the right information to make sure you think through what are the what are the processes for your business that you should get in place? What are the financials that you need to understand? What are all of these things that potentially you can do um, to prepare for what that next step might be? So at the yard, when uh, you know when I was asked to speak um, here today, I started looking at well, who are some of the companies at the yard that might that we might want to target? And one of the things I did was look at who has been at the yard for a very long time. As Rebecca mentioned, there have been companies that have been there um, for, for, for a really long time. Um, so over 15% of the companies at the yard have actually been there for over two decades. So they have really seen that growth at the yard, but also I know personally from speaking to a lot of those business owners, um, that, that they feel like Eyestone, that they feel like Eric. They have had teams there for, um, for a very long time. It's part of their family. Um, most of the businesses at the yard really sit in that two to 10 employee uh, count. That's over 50% of the businesses at the yard. So, you know, it's not, you're not going to work with strangers. These are people who are, who have believed in your values and your work ethic, which you as the business owner put forward every day for your business. And, and they have they have helped you grow this, this baby of a business um, that then turns into teenager and then grows up. But um, so I think that they are very invested in this business as well. And, and you know, they, they want to, it, and, and, and they believe in it and they have worked very hard to make it grow. So I think that from an owner's perspective, you know, uh, that the treating of their employees as they retire or as they move on is also something that I know weighs heavily on a lot of our business owners' minds. And how do we, I don't want to leave that. I had a conversation with a business owner where he was like, I, what are they going to do? I don't want to, I don't want to retire. I'm ready to retire, but I don't know, you know, um, what happens to my employees. Some of them have been here for so long. So I, I think that, um, I think this program is, is fantastic. And, and as I said, I, you know, I'm happy to share um, these resources with our companies because I think they're so valuable. Um, and, th and then I'll let Eric talk because everyone wants to hear about from the person who actually did the program. Um, but just, uh, just a brief overview from, from my perspective. Well, thank you so much, Myra. Um, so many thoughts that I'm going to want to bring up, but I really just want to pitch it wholeheartedly to Eric to uh, dive into your story and your perspective. Um, sure. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. So, you know, pleasure to be here. Um, and I appreciate the work that everybody's doing to um, encourage uh, employee ownership. Um, I am, let's say, philosophically aligned with that uh, and um, and pursuing that actively at the moment. So um, I think it's a great thing. Uh, I am Eric Greenberg. I am the owner of Green Mountain Graphics. We are a primarily sign shop doing mostly what's called architectural signage. We sell signs mostly to office buildings in Manhattan. I would say this, if you've ever walked through Rockefeller Center, you've seen our signs. So we are active in the uh, commercial real estate market in New York doing signs, all kinds of signs for all buildings. We also do awards and promotional products as part of our diversity. Um, once we have your logo, we can do a lot of different things in it, hence the little poster behind me. Um, we are currently in Sunnyside. Uh, business was founded in 1969 by my father. Uh, out of his painting contracting shop on the Lower East Side of uh, Manhattan. He was a born and bred Manhattanite uh, um, from the Lower East Side and um, came back from World War II, started a painting contracting business 
and uh, eventually realized that his future did not lie in swinging from a scaffold at the age of 50 years old. So he looked for something that was a little less taxing and he found sign making. I came into the business in 1978. In 1992, I started the process of uh, essentially buying the business from my parents. And in 1994, the business was reincorporated as Green Mountain Graphics with myself as the owner, and we moved from Manhattan to Long Island City. Currently, we're in our third location in Long Island City, a sign of the changing times. Our first two locations are now six-story condos. So that's the story of Long Island City. Um, I started uh, thinking about um, employee ownership, or at least transitioning the business, when I realized that my original um, retirement plan was never to never retire. There was time in my life I thought I'm never going to retire. I'm just going to keep working. You know, um, you know. I think Myra's point about um, being a small business owner being a lifestyle is very true. Uh, you can ask my wife; she will attest to that. Um, so, you know, this is sort of a 24/7 job. I mean, frankly, I was here yesterday. You know, I come in on the weekends just to catch up on things. It's 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 a huge commitment. And, and not something that's easy to think about stepping away from. Um, I mean, my dad uh, originally thought that um, he would uh, pass the business on in his will. He wanted to work till the day he died. Um, some people have that philosophy. At, at a point I realized that was really not for me. Um, I, I would like to um, uh, step back. Uh, my wife is retired. I wanna join her, do some other things. So I looked at the options. What are the options for a small business owner, uh, 11 employees, um, some of whom have been with me a very long time, 20 years, 15 years, 18 years. Uh, you know, my response about trying to take care of the employees weighed on my mind. Absolutely. These people were loyal to me. They helped me build a business. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever quality of life that myself and my family have enjoyed is in part due to their efforts. And, and I believe that deserves a reward. Um, or at least acknowledgement. Um, so the options that I identified were a third party sale, uh, whether to somebody in my industry or not, basically using a business broker most likely and selling the business to some independent party, uh, selling the business to the employees or liquidating and walking away, which was not very attractive. So um, I did speak to some business brokers and I was not convinced that that was a good road to go down. First of all, the statistic that only one in five small businesses of this type um, will successfully sell was kind of discouraging. I've read other things that say that there is a glut of baby boomer owners retiring uh, at this particular point in time, hence flooding the market with businesses for sale. So there's no guarantee the business would sell to a third party. There's no guarantee that the third party would sell anywhere near what I was asking for it. There's no guarantee that the third party wouldn't make demands on me that I found unreasonable. Um, it's really the feeling I had that I would be getting myself into something that I couldn't control and might not be very happy with. Uh, on the other hand, um, it was my accountant who, when I was discussing this with him, said, well, your employees are your best bet. They know the business, they know the customers, they know the vendors, they know the processes. They're the people who really can take the business and run with it. So um, I ended up working uh, with ICA. I believe you're going to hear from ICA in this presentation. And I have to say they were fabulous. Um, they are fabulous. Um, um, my consultants have two consultants. One's more of a financial analyst side of things. The other's more of a human resources side of things. The combination really has us covered in all the areas that we need to address to successfully make this transition. We've had any number of meetings. Um, uh, myself with the consultants, the entire group with the consultants. At this point, I know who's in, who's not in. And uh, we're just waiting on uh, hearing from the, um, the, the lending institution um, to finalize the deal. And we hope to close by the end of July. So I'm very excited about it. And I, um, I'm wholeheartedly behind this venture. Um, I can't say enough uh, about how grateful I am to New York City for providing the support to ICA, to ICA for providing the support to us. And um, I just look forward to the successful completion of this. One other thing I'd add as a reason to sell to the employees, in my case at least, is it's allowing me to sort of set the own term, to set my terms of retirement. For example, I told, um, I told the worker, the prospective worker owners, my current employees, I told them that, well, year one, I wanna work four days a week. And year two, we'll see. 
and we'll negotiate a salary. So I get to call some of the shots of how I retire and I get to ease into retirement. I've seen many people go cold turkey on retirement and it's not always a happy sight. So I thought that for myself, um, stepping down to four days, perhaps stepping down to three days, easing out of it, taking more time for myself, less time for the business, but still being here to be the guiding hand, which they requested. Um, I think that's the best option for me. And I would really uh, urge anybody to give strong thought to it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. And I'm delighted that you started with I'm phys philosophically aligned because I want to touch on the notion of philosophy at this moment, which when I was a kid, if I knew what that was, maybe I would have followed it, but I thought it was just about Aristotle. But what it really is, is what I believe, what I believe, what I consider to believe. And as I framed earlier, and I don't want to uh, go go all in on this, but I want to offer it as a foundation. We're facing a lot of inequality on this planet, a lot of challenge with climate change. Um, and perhaps the best solution is a big sense of us, we, right? So in your world, your we becomes the workers that have been part of uh, what you duly know. You know, they help build this company. They know the best. And what does that do when we engage them in the solution that you're able to talk with them about the terms that would work for you? Also thinking in terms almost like, well, it is a family business, but as in families, there are generations. And as the elders know that as they age, they can pass it on to the middle generation. And as they grow up, really looking at it as generational, not, um, not nuclear family, but the family of the business, who's next in the company, who's younger, who's gonna be there longer, who can take it to the next level, really embracing that notion of we are a community and we are going to solve this problem. I believe that that um, actually translates to the much bigger problem on our planet or sets of problems on our planet. Each one does what we can where we are, building a stronger community, and then does is able to make the company function because everybody feels so proud of that. Um, at the college, I teach a course, and uh, we have a whole certificate program actually on workplace democracy and community ownership. But one of the things I talk about is um, economic democracy is one frame here. An economy simply is the um, how we produce and distribute the stuff that we need. It isn't qualified one way or another, but we can qualify it with cooperation. We can say a cooperative economy takes a cooperative way of how we produce and distribute the stuff that we need. And that cooperative space is really one where everybody is uplifted and engaged um, and needs to learn different things. You said that you had advisors on finance and advisors on HR. And I'm curious, um, in terms of training and advancement, what are some things you're thinking that you already want people to learn, things that you know are being promoted uh, for them to learn? We have ICA Group as an example of a place of education, SBS, and, and the notion of we are always learning. So how are we transferring some of the knowledge of your business to the workforce? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a prime concern. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing this, sitting in this chair now for a long time. So um, I'm sort of like the default guy for a lot of stuff. So I did put together a list of um, of um, my tasks, I guess, or the things I do. I, I spent one week recording, um, it, well, I didn't do it sequentially, but I basically spent five different days uh, recording everything I do um, during the work day. Uh, just making shorthand notes, uh, you know, making a sales call, I'm doing payroll, I'm looking at some marketing, um, whatever I'm doing, I, I made notes at the end. Of, and then at a point, I took all that and I analyzed it and I broke it down to what are my tasks, what are my activities, what are the things that I've been doing that, that other people are going to need to do. And then um, I met with um, uh, the people who um, will be taking over my roles and reviewed it with them and um, said, you know, let's, let's have a conversation about how you're going to ease into taking these things over. Um, I don't see it as being, you know, um, let's, say we, let's say we do in fact close on, um, on July 30th, which is the last Friday in July. Um, 
you know, I don't see it as July 30th, I'm doing everything. And then, you know, August 2nd, everybody else is doing everything. I think I'm still here four days a week doing a great deal, but my role becomes more, okay, come in my office, do this with me. Let me show you how I do this. Let me, let me help you sit in this chair when the time comes for me not to be here. And, um, and, and, and that's how I see it. Now, ICA is committed to helping with that process. Um, I shared my, my task and activity list with them. Uh, we're still reviewing it. We're still talking about how to make that work functionally. Uh, I believe that it'll take, um, you know, probably six months to a year. It's kind of like breaking in any new employee. Any, any new employee, you know, does not hit the ground running. It takes six months to a year to incorporate them into the culture, into the workflow and all of that. And I don't think it'll be any different with this. Um, I, I'd like to think that at the end of year one, um, I can say to them, hey, you know, you guys are doing great. Uh, you know, uh, you can write to me at my new address in Fiji, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think that um, uh, I'm gonna continue to slowly transition out as they assume more and more and hopefully make it grow. I mean, I really, I'm really pitching it to them as this is your opportunity to make this thing grow. Your, your combined efforts should have a better result than, you know, just poor old me. You know, I did, my, I did my best for a long time. I'm satisfied with what I did, but I'm one guy. You're a bunch of people, smart people, capable people. You put your efforts together. I think you can take this uh, business and really do much more with it than I did um, during my time running it. Thank you, Eric. Beautiful. I want to invite Myra to uh, jump in with different thoughts that you've had. If you need a prompt, I certainly have a dozen questions I can throw your way, but I see your head nodding. No, so no, no. I mean, I, I think that a lot of what Eric is saying is, is true. There's, I think that it's just all a process, right? So I think that as I think about how to help our businesses even learn about this, it's a process of getting them to think about this. And then what are your options, exploring the options. And then next is, you know, there's an onboarding, as Eric said, if you will, of there was a process to you learning your business, but there's also a process to you handing that off. And I think that, you know, thinking through the different, um, the different needs and, and because I think it's, it's also, and you know, when, when we had talked about this previously, it's a daunting process, right? From an emotional as well as, uh, as, as um, like an actual process point for a, for a business owner to think about retirement, to think about, uh, you know, what happens to this business, to think about selling or your different options. So I think it's, you know, thinking about, you know, what your options are and really exploring that and, and thinking about what are the systems to have in place, right, as you prepare and, and things that mean something to you. Because I think the other thing is that this, that when you, you're a business owner, a lot, so many of your values of who you are, of, you know, are, are sort of ingrained in this business. And I think that people want to see those things move forward, how you treat a customer, how you, you know, your your speed and responding to people, all of those things I think are sometimes things that give people anxiety. So documenting not only the, the process for how you build the thing or do the thing, but also what are the things that have made you successful over all these years, right? Eric knows now uh, one of the things that, that lives in your brain is all of the lessons that you've learned along the way. So how do you document the things that you don't even think about anymore, but that happened and that you learned from and to make sure that, that, you're, that your team has that moving forward and is able to, to take that and, and really not have to learn the mistake again, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because I, I, I mentioned as an educator, but I went into education from the standpoint of um, work. I was teaching carpenters, apprentices, how to be a carpenter and, and then really listening to the employers, what changes are in the market, what do they need to know? And that same question, what changes are in the market and what do you need to know becomes this guiding light for any business. What changes in the market and what do you need to know? And then if what's changing in the market of the company is how things are um, perhaps run at the senior level, what tasks need to be taught? How do people learn this? Um, you know, I, I learned from um, a grocery co-op how they were making sure everybody understood um, the whole notion of profit so that they, if they could see when there's leftover money, 
we might call that the profit, that surplus, how can it be redistributed to make the company better before it gets extracted and sent elsewhere? And that whole notion of how can we be more profitable so that we can turn more money into the company or ourselves was eye-opening for people rather than just thinking, what wage am I fighting for? What ways am I fighting for? Um, more, more thoughts, um, Eric or Myra? I think you know each of you, first, we have a few more minutes and then I'll turn it over to actually Karen Bonarth from Hot Bread Kitchens. Yeah, I would say this. I think that um, one of the things I'm finding as our conversations internally continue, and we, you know, we we continue down this path, and people are feeling a sense of being, you know, included in it and buying into it, is um, I'm hearing all kinds of ideas that people may have sat on in the past and not wanted to, you know, not wanting to vocalize because you know they weren't the boss, you know, um, they weren't in charge, they didn't have a stake in it. So, um, you know, to your point, it's, um, you know, the inclusiveness of it um, is really starting to generate new ideas um, that I, you know, maybe, not, maybe not new to them because they've been holding them all along, but new to me and new to the company because they held back on, on voicing them. And that's why, you know, it's kind of exciting to, to get this fresh infusion of, of ideas and, and energy. Um, I think people, uh, the people who are coming into this are, are energized by it and um, they're coming into it wanting to make it work. And, I, and that's what will make it work. So it's, you know, it's kind of exciting to me. Um, you know, not to mention that, um, you know, it's a way of um, providing income for myself, even, you know, sort of as I slide into retirement, I forgot to mention that part of it. Um, and I think that's important to any selling owner. It's like, what am I going to get out of it? You know, just like anybody's thinking. And I think this was a good way for me to sort of, um, if not maximize, certainly get very fair value for the transition of the company. I'm very satisfied with the, with where we're at with the terms of it, and I believe the um, you know the prospective worker owners, the current employees, are as well. So I think it's a win-win. I really want to um, honor the notion of fair value, so that nobody feels like they're getting ripped off or robbed from and contributing to, and you're not feeling like you're walking away with a big loss, like you were afraid if there were no buyers in the end, what would happen? So really trying to convert the value of the company into something that brings, um, uplifts a lot of workers and their engagement and gives you a sustainable uh, retirement plan. Myra, do you wanna add some things, I think in terms of just maybe a, a wind down for, you touch so many businesses, what would be some takeaways or some hopes that you think you'd want to bring to the Navy Yard? Yeah, um, well, I, I feel that, you know, my hope for our, for my department in general and um, is to just make sure that I have all of the information out there. I think that there is so much information out on the web and like now you can go and there's all these programs. And so understanding what is a, a good match for people and being able to sort of connect the dots for our tenants as this is a great opportunity for you because of things that we have, you know, that you have shared, or this is an option that you should explore. And just making sure that I'm connecting people to the right information and, and speaking to them. And one of the questions, and we'll wait for the Q&A, but one of the questions that I have for Eric is also, you know, what are some of the challenges uh, when you talked to the employees? Uh, you know, a, a lot of our, a lot of our companies um, employ, you know, LMI or low to moderate income employees that have been in these manufacturing jobs. So, you know, how do you, how do you convince people like now you, you can be a part of this, you can be an owner, you yeah. know, what is the, what are the ways to communicate? Because I think that for me, and this is so, this is so interesting to also hear Eric's story and to get more information because I just want to make sure that I'm presenting things in the right way to companies and that we're really presenting these as, as options that people should be exploring. Is that, is that, is that an okay answer? Like, is that what you meant? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes me say, I wanna talk with you more. I mean, all the, the whole thing of education and training is a part of it, right? It's, 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 it's a lever in the solution. The lever is a willingness of an owner to say, I wanna think about this and then really figuring out what all those resources are. And the owner to owners hotline and the city council funding has made some resources available. And as education and training inside CUNY and in other 
uh, popular education spaces, more, more training, more, you know, more capacity, more capacity. Yeah. Um, I want to invite um, um, Karen Bonharth to the panel to sort of pitch a couple of her either closing remarks for the panel or um, she's with Hot Bread Kitchens, which has been very busy both training people to do work in food in the food sector and to help them run their own companies. Thanks, Rebecca, and um, thanks for making a little space for me. I um, So as Rebecca said, I'm with Hopper Kitchen. We're a nonprofit organization. We do workforce development and small business services in the food service sector. Um, and Eric said something really critical just a few minutes ago. He talked about the win-win, and that's really what we look for. We look for models that can create good quality jobs as well as pathways for business owners um, to create sustainable business models. And I, what What's so exciting to me about employee ownership is that these two things come together, right? They converge um, in this place where assets can be kept in the hands of the people who built them. I think Myra talked a little bit about that, right? Why can't we keep these assets with those people who are really responsible for growing them? And they ensure that these businesses, which are so critical um, to the nature of our city. I mean, I think about food all the time, right? With What's New York without these amazing small food businesses? Businesses that we have, and I know it, it goes well beyond that to printing services and everything else, but it ensures that these businesses can continue and just really keeps our city such a, a vibrant place. So I am phil philosophically on board as well, Rebecca and Hot Bread Kitchen is, and um, we're excited to support any business owners who'd like to follow this path. So thank you for inviting me in. I love it. And um... There are so many ways that we can expand. Uh, I do believe that training people is a big part of it, whether you are the owner uh, sharing, as Eric said, you know, on a, you know, pulling people in and saying, this is how I do it. You try it now to actually formalize training. So speaking of formalized training, let's bring in uh, Kathy Moran Lubinsky, who's with uh, Small Business Services and I invite you to, um, well, introduce yourself. I can probably read it, but you might be able to do a better job on that. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. And um, it is a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, as I, my name is Kathy Morell Lubinsky, and I too am a former, a former New York City business owner. I was really inspired by this conversation. Um, Myra talked about some of the big feelings that come with owning a business, which I was like checking everyone off when she was saying it. And Eric's description of kind of like the blood, sweat, and tears that go into owning a business. Um, so all of these things really resonate with me as a former business owner. I've been at um, New York, the Department of Small Business Services, SBS, for almost two years. Um, I did sell my business a while ago, but I'm here to share with you an opportunity. It's another opportunity that the city offers, and it's called the Customized Training Grant. Thank you. Um, and please note that anything that I share today, we will send you an email, a link, we have a webinar that you, if you're interested, you can kind of just like get some more information on it. So it could be a lot to take in. Um, but in the context of today's discussion, I'll just go over the program in a few minutes and let you know how this program, customized training can support businesses who are in the beginning, the middle, the end of a conversion process. Um, it also is, it's available to any New York City business that, um, that is eligible, but we have had recently a few um, businesses within the process of conversion, and we really think that it can be a good fit. Um, so I'll, give, I'll start by giving you an overview, thank you. So in short, customized training, it's a, it's a one-year competitive reimbursable grant for New York City-based businesses, and it's delivered through employee training. Um, so the grant can range from three hundred to four hundred thousand um, dollars. Kind of the whole gist of the grant is a business identifies challenges that they are having and then presents a training plan or trainings that they say will um, help support and overcome these challenges. So they become a thriving New York City based business. Um, a business does need to pay for training upfront, so there has to be a, some level of economic stability, um, and we do reimbursements on a quarterly basis. A big question that comes up often with customized training is employees can take various trainings. People, they tra employees can take all the same training, they can take different trainings, there can be some kind of hybrid of all of that, but it's really, the whole point is in the name, it is customized to a business needs. Um, 
employees of the business have about a year to finish the training. And upon completion of the training, businesses are asked to provide wage increases to the employees who went to training. And the whole thought process there is that we hope that this training gets you on board with training. If a business hasn't done training yet, it actually, you get a return on investment and you just share a portion of that with your employees. Uh, next slide, please. So there's certain businesses, again, a business has, to, in terms of eligibility, a business has to be in one of New York City's five boroughs, for profit, in operation for a year, able to pay for uh, training up front. You have to train at least 10 employees. That said, we have something called a consortium application, which is when a couple of businesses, several businesses get together and apply together and they have 10 trainees um, uh, combined or more for that matter. But what's really nice about that is uh, there's a lot of efficiencies. There could be different businesses who, uh, um, employees who are in the same boat that need the same training. Again, they can still have different trainings, but it's really also creating this sense of community and working together and, and the coming together. Um, and then able to provide a, uh, wage increases at the end of the program. The employee's eligibility is fairly simple, 18 years or older, working at a business in New York City, meet the federal state minimum wage standards. There is a salary cap. An employee cannot make more than $78-ish thousand dollars or more than $37.50 an hour. Um, and as I mentioned before, they do have to be paid during training. Next slide, please. So if if a business if if a business was going to apply, you just I, I you identify a challenge that you may be having or challenges that you may be having, um, and we kind of bucket these into four different categories. So a business could say, Hey, listen, I just purchased new equipment or software, and I need help training my employees or some of the employees. That could be some of the training that people do. Another other businesses can say, uh, I I want to offer new service or products to reach new markets. That's another one of the, the business challenges. Um, some people say I need to promote or give staff new skills to advance, right? It's all about upskilling. Um, and last, and something that we hear from older businesses is, hey, my employees, they, their, their skills are obsolete. In order for me to remain competitive in this marketplace, I need to train them. We need this different training. We need to change things. We need management training. We need leadership training. We need... Um, and any kind of training that will help your business. So this is just kind of giving you an overview of a business presents challenges and then the trainings that they want to take. Next slide. So in terms of how, how, how would this work if a business or businesses were decided to apply for the grant and they're in the process, the business could in the process, the middle, the end, converted. Um, what we ask you to do is you can, it can be trainings that are related to um, employee ownership trainings. It could also be if trainings that are oh, like you're converting and there's some big picture things that you need to do. But then you also might have a marketing person who needs to freshen up on their social media or someone who needs leadership skills. So it's kind of all, it, it can be a, a we, our goal is to have very robust training plans so businesses can get the most out of this grant, but finding a balance of not too much training that it's not gonna be done. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, it can be one business applying and or a consortium of businesses applying. Um, I thank you today, Rebecca. I look forward to hearing from anyone who is interested in this opportunity. As a former business owner, I wish I had known about this opportunity because my business did, did value training, but we, we were a small business and we couldn't afford it. Um, so I thank you and I hope to hear from some of you and good luck in this process if you uh, go down that road. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, Sorry, Rebecca. I love this. I'm good. Oh, on to, I'm going to pass it back to you. And I know we will have time for Q&A in a little bit. So I hope um, attendees are queuing up their cues for the A's. Great, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Rebecca, Myra, Eric, and Kathy for um, all of you contributed so far. It's a great conversation and amazing resources. And Karen as well, thank you. Um, 
So now we're going to hear a little bit more about owner to owners. Um, we're going to hear from Shelly Miller, who is a technical assistance provider with ICA Group, one of the owner to owners partners, as well as Julian McKinley, who is with Democracy at Work Institute, um, which I'm also with as well. Um, and uh, just pass it on to Shelly and Julian. Thanks so much, Antu. Um, I can't get my, ca my camera started. Uh, so if the host can unlock my camera, I can do that. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. Just let you all know a little bit more about owner to owners. Um, thank you so much. All right, now you can see me. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed the conversation today. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Myra, Eric, Karen. Um, it was really, it was particularly great to hear the experience of Eric. Um, you should know that all of the support that Eric provide, was provided through ICA Group is also the support that Owner to Owners connects you business owners with. Um, ICA Group is one of three organizations within Owner to Owners and they have decades of experience helping businesses transition ownership. Um, so contact us to get in touch and we can ensure that you have a successful transition or are able to um, learn a bit more about employee ownership to, to see if it is the right choice for you. Succession is certainly a difficult decision. Um, and we just heard obviously uh, some of the benefits of employee ownership, including how it can support a successful retirement. Um, if you are planning a business exit or succession, transitioning ownership to your employees provides significant benefit to you. Um, it provides benefit to your employees as well as your community. And uh, Eric referenced the difficulty selling a business on, on the traditional market. Actually, 80% of businesses is the, is the number that fail to sell uh, for lack of a buyer when they enter the traditional market. And employee ownership provides an immediate solution with clear benefits by identifying uh, employees as a buyer um, and then guiding that sale. So as a business owner, Employee ownership can provide you also with a, a fair market price um, for the business that you have built over time. Along with that value, you can benefit from significant tax breaks. And for the businesses and employees, um, employee ownership helps preserve jobs and improve business, improve business operations as well. Uh, next slide. So Owner to Owners is an employee ownership NYC initiative. It's a city funded program designed to ensure that you, the business owner, uh, employees and the community continue to benefit from the incredible business that you've built over time. Um, we are there to help you from start to finish to understand if employee ownership is the right fit for you. Um, we can provide access to capital. We can provide a business valuation, um, training and education to, to support the, the successful transition um, and more. Next slide. So visit us at owner to ownersnyc today. Um, again, we provide a complete range of services. Uh, you, can, you can call us at 646-363-6592 to get started. You'll talk to someone right on the phone. You can ask them some basic questions and then we'll get some information to really begin um, the process of educating you and connecting you potentially with, the, with, um, with this process that can provide direct benefits to you, to your employees and your community. Um, it's important to note that this is at no cost to you. Again, this is all city funded. Um, so call us today or visit our website at owner to owners .nyc. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for that great intro about owner to owners. And um, for, for those attending in the chat, you can connect directly with the owner to owners transition experts at 646-363-6592 or visit www.owner, the number two, owners.nyc. That's owner to owners.nyc. So moving on now to the Q&A, um, where we'll be joined by Shelly Miller um, with ICA Group, one of the technical assistance providers who's done really amazing work with, um, with Eric's company, with Green Mountain Graphics, as well as um, just generally speaking in New York City and nationwide on uh, converting to worker ownership. So we'll start with a few questions. Um, uh, for example, uh, what businesses are elig eligible for owner to owners? And then we have a few other questions as well for Eric and for Myra, but we'll get started with Shelly. Okay, it can be a business from any industry. Um, we do say that the minimum number of employees you need to have is three, but even three is really quite small to successfully try to transition. So you probably should have at least seven to eight to really consider doing this. But uh, any industry is good. 
uh, one caveat I would say is that it needs to be an industry where you don't have a lot of like transient employees. So for instance, fast food might be difficult because you know you have young people who are working a couple of months or weeks and leaving. You need people who've been around for a while. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and this, this question is for Eric. There's actually a couple of questions, but um, first, what advice, Eric, uh, would you give to a business considering tr transition to employee ownership? And what gives you confidence that your employees can run the business? Uh, two very different questions. Um, I think my advice is if you're even thinking about um, employee ownership as a, as a path forward, contact Shelly Miller. <laughs> contact <laughs> Um, or, or the business to business hotline, they'll put you in touch. I guess there are different agencies. I just have good things to say about IPA. So, you know, here we go. Um, but yeah, you, you, you need to talk to somebody who knows about the process because frankly, I mean, to me, and I keep saying this to the employees, this is new to me as it is to you. I, I knew absolutely nothing about it, uh, until it was identified as even a possibility to me. And, and that was by um, seeing actually, uh, I think it's David, I forget his last name, um, your executive director. I saw him at the um, at, at a, um, a, a workshop that was um, uh, the Long Island City Partnership had scheduled. And, um, uh, you know, it was there that, uh, uh, you know, it was a succession strategy workshop. There was a, an attorney there speaking about traditional means of, of selling a business. And there was uh, David there from ICA speaking about worker transition. There was another organization represented as well. I got fortunate in that I got hooked up with ICA. So talk to an expert, that's, that's number one. Uh, the second question, what gives me confidence? Well, um, I, uh, you know, blind faith, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of confidence in the people here. Uh, I mean, you know, I have a, you know, a guy in my shop is here 20 years. He knows the, he knows the machines left, right, and upside down. Um, he knows the customers. Uh, I'll, I'll go back there and I'll say, oh, I just heard from this customer. Uh, what do we give him? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it right here. You know, let me look that up. I got it. it, it they know more than me about a lot of this stuff, quite honestly. I can't know everything. Um, so their experience is, is really, um, I guess, the first uh, building block of success. And the second is their motivation. The people who are, are, are coming into this um, have all expressed to me that they are highly motivated. They want this to work. I'm here, like I said, I'm hearing ideas and potentialities that, that were never discussed before. So I think the combination of um, experience, uh, knowledge of the business and motivation to make it work, um, you know, uh, is what gives me confidence. But you know, if you're a small business owner, you know that um, you know the wind shift. Uh, nothing is guaranteed. You, your your success and the success of this venture will depend on what people put into it. So I guess at the end of the day, I'm banking that they're going to put into it what needs to be put into it and make it work. Thank you, Eric. That's um, for your insight. Um, we have a question from David Zarin with Zarin Fabrics. I'm a big fan of that store and it is definitely an iconic Lower East Side institution. Um, what if many of my key employees are nearing retirement themselves? Shelley, do you have uh, any, any thoughts and then follow-ups from Eric and Myra? And that, that is a good question. And you know, um, in another conversation this kind of came up uh, that there's a lot of talk about the silver tsunami that's happening on the side of owners, but as it turns out, there's a similar issue um, on the side of employees, particularly in certain types of, of industries. And I, I thought about what Eric said earlier about um, hoping that in the transition, one of the things that he hopes is that the employees will look to grow the business and expand the business and, and do new things. And part of that, I would say is like, bringing in new workers and training new workers, which can bring in some of the city training programs. One we've talked about here and there are, are others like, um, I think it's called the C, the career and technical education program that they do with, with younger folk that a lot of these kinds of um, long-term traditional businesses uh, that 
teach particular kinds of skills would be great for combining as a way of transitioning of the older employees out and keeping the business going. And they would be able to gradually go in the same way that Eric has described what he likes about how he'll be able to retire. So, yeah, so that's kind of a new wrinkle for us to start thinking about. You know, if I may, I'll add something. Um, what came up and hasn't been mentioned before is um, some of my employees are um, not that far behind me. Um, and, you know, when we first approached, you know, broached this idea, um, I heard a lot of, um, you know, sort of pushback. Well, I'm not going to be working that many more years. And what do I want to get involved? And does it really make sense when I'm at this age already? But as it turns out, you know, the same employees are, are, are now the most enthusiastic. Part of the reason being, it's generational. They see their kids coming into it. They see this as an opportunity to bring their children in, not just for, you know, summer, you know, um, you know, clerical jobs that, that we like to offer to the employees' kids, but, you know, to really train them in something and give something. Um, you know, my, I have three kids. They all pursue different paths. Uh, they're all in their own professions. And, and if my kids were taking over the business, quite honestly, um, I might not be in this position. But for the employees to be able to think about it as being generational, I think that's really exciting. I know it really, it really changed their thinking once we, once we broadened it to include that kind of thing. Great point. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a definitely a, a wonderful point to bring up about this is about continuity for employees, fam, employee owners, families as well, not just for the, you know, the initial owners, families. And the so, continuity of, of great businesses. I see, I don't know who wrote, yeah, a David, Zarin wrote that and an LES landmark uh, regarding Zarin Fabrics. So these things are really important too for communities and for the city. Absolutely. So we have room for one more question. And uh, this is from Myra. Um, how can Brooklyn Navy Yard help its businesses think long term and get out of the day to day of running a business? <laughs> <laughs> I think about that every day. <laughs> I also, you know, I, th I think running a business is, is hard because it's hard to work on your business and not in your business, right? Like, I think a challenge has come up. And even if you think about this particular moment, manufacturing is changing. So you you think about the changes even within manufacturing, but but even in this COVID-19 moment, it's a new thing that you're thinking about and, uh, and manufacturing wasn't as affected as other industries, but it was. So there's always, I mean, it's like life, right? There's always something that's popping up that you're having to deal with. And so I think that in terms of how I facilitate that, I, I think the Brooklyn, the way that I think about it from the Brooklyn Navy Yards perspective is how can I eliminate steps, right? And what I was saying earlier to, uh, in terms of how do I learn how to talk about this so that I'm making it as clear and I'm providing uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm presenting things to our, our companies in the simplest way possible, outlining what potentially can work for them, right? And, and really understanding our companies, like we, we, you know, we do an annual tenant survey, we're forever trying to get people to respond to surveys to really understand who are the companies at the yard and what do they need? If, if I can understand that, then I'm best positioned to be able to direct all of this best programs and services to them. And if I can cut through some of the steps to just say, this, this works for you for these three reasons. And I know this because I, you shared this information, I, then I think we're we're ahead of the game. And I always think about this as what are the things that I wish somebody would have done for me when I was a business owner? And I know that sometimes I was just too overwhelmed in my business to, to read through all of the materials and, and, and think about, well, does this really fit? So simplifying from my standpoint is what I really um, hope to, to do. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mara. Um, and I know we're a little bit over, so thank, grateful for everybody who stayed on a little bit extra. Um, thank you again to all the panelists and special guests who join us today. Special thanks to Eric for sharing your story um, and Mara for joining us on the panel, sharing what Brooklyn Navy Yard can do to support um, owners. 
Um, and if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to the Owner to Owners hotline at 646-363-6592 or visit owner, the number two, owners.nyc. Thanks again, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody.